right. Episode number 98 is about to undergo tonight on this March 11th, the last day of Disruptors March 4th. So Disruptors March 4th has been, it's been this week, right? That we have challenged fellow disruptors across the globe to utilize this week as Disruptors Unite. So what that means is we want people um, to commit to whatever they are and whatever position they're in, um, in education or outside of education to say, hey, you know what? We are going to speak to um, our colleagues, our peers, our friends about trauma-informed education. And I'm going to be honest with you all. It was a very spontaneous, 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 spontaneous. All right. Can you hear me? Okay, just a second. Okay, remember, Taisha, I told you that I have this new fancy little thing, right? It didn't work. It Did you all hear? Did you hear the buzzing? Okay, so I only heard the buzzing. That's good. Um, it was terrible. It was awful. It, like, buzzed my whole ears. I'm glad you guys didn't hear it. Um, you were like a, like a scratch mix record. Spontaneous, spontaneous, spontaneous. Oh, yeah. It was intense. Like, um, yeah. So here's what we're going to do. For those of you who are live, uh, we're going to start over. Okay. Uh, we're going to try this again from the top. Thank you all for the those of you who are here. Uh, we're going to start this over and hopefully that doesn't happen again. I had to actually unplug this little machine because it was so terribly loud. All right. Here we go. We're going to try it again. All right, we're back. Episode 98 of the Trauma Informed Educators Network podcast. Tonight is a very special, exciting guest. Can't wait to tell you all about. But it is exciting. Another reason, too, it's March 11th. This is the last day of March 4th, Disruptors March 4th, which has been a week of this, uh, this spontaneous idea of uh, from, I'll be honest, it's a text chain. We're all texting each other. And somebody said, we ought to do like a designated day. And I'm like, I've been thinking about this for a while. March 4th is a great day to do something on. So we said disruptors March 4th um, and tell people about trauma-informed education across the globe. If you're in education, just talking to colleagues, talking to peers, um, presenting professional development, whatever it is you do in your capacity to do that, right? So March 4th ends today. You all listen to this. This is pretty insane. So in a week of us just saying, hey, we're going to try this. We had 45 people register from 18 different states and three different countries committed to this week sharing about trauma-informed education in their circles. We had uh, New Zealand represented the United States and Fiji. We had someone register in Fiji that they're sharing a total of you all. Are you ready? This is pretty crazy. Almost 3,300 people were impacted by this week of educators saying, I'm committing to talking about this amazing work that we have dedicated so much time, effort, heart, sweat, and a lot of tears to try to get these paradigm shifts happening in this, in this work of trauma-informed education. So shout out to you all who are here, who, who committed to that, who participated in that. Um, and to our, my friends who some of you had some of the ideas, thank you for sharing those ideas and, and collaborating with us uh, to get this to happen. So guess what? This will happen every year. 
March 4th will happen every year. Disruptors, March 4th, right? And next year, I'll have these ready for everyone. My unapologetic disruptor for good t-shirts will be ready. I sold out of them at the ATN conference, um, although we did have two people win t-shirts. Um, and I don't have, I do have their names. Sarah Therrett for Morgan City, Louis, uh, Morgan City, Louisiana, and Kim Baker from Canton, Ohio. You will be getting uh, one of these t-shirts as soon as I get the next run printed, which they should be getting printed soon. Um, and for those of you who have said, I want a t-shirt, I want a t-shirt, I want a t-shirt. I'm trying to work with the drop shipper right now that you can order them and they'll ship them. I tried that. It is a train wreck and you probably wouldn't get your t-shirts for three weeks because um, I've got a lot going on. So just know that is the case. But nonetheless... You all, I cannot explain to you how excited I am about tonight because I, I'm so excited that we actually made this like a special episode that I, I was like, uh, we got it, we got to do it soon. So tonight's guest, Dr. Taisha Noyes, has approximately 24 years supporting and nurturing, creating success with underserved populations from coast to coast in both nonprofit and educator, educational settings. She served as a special. Uh, and general education teacher, high school administrator, and middle school principal. She has extensive experience building systems to support best practices and has been passionate, a passionate coach of teachers and leaders in the academic content as well as special education, athletics, and leadership. Her primary research has been focused on how trauma-informed schools and leaders can cultivate better and more equitable outcomes for students in underserved communities. Her passion project is creating faith-based content and products to uplift, encourage, and inform young children and their families through their company, Heaven Sent Kids. Dr. Noyes received her doctorate degree in education leadership from Azusa Pacific University and currently serves as the coordinator of equity and access with the Los Angeles County, uh, uh, County of Education, uh, where she still supports equity, diversity, and inclusion in initiatives on behalf of counties and 80 LEAs and over a 300 charter schools. Um, what a amazing, oh, 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 and only you all, only 2 million kids. I mean, just only nearly 2 million. I mean, no big deal. Dr. Noise. Oh, I forgot one thing. And Dr. Noise is one of the co-authors of our book that's coming out at, uh, from Harvard Education Press in the spring of 2025. Oh, Dr. Noise, when the conversation was like, should we have Dr. Noise as an author? Myself and others were like, yes, absolutely, 100%. So, Dr. Noise, welcome to the podcast. I, I'm so excited to introduce you to my friends, my co author, Dr. Noise. Welcome and tell us a little bit more about you. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm humbled and honored as always to be here with your audience, but with you. Um, I'm so excited about the work that you are doing. Um, a long road, I think, brings me to this, but I think everything in life brings you to the right moments. Um, I'm a little black girl from South Central LA um, who went to public school her whole life, for the record. Um, and I think what draws me to this work most, realizing, right, you live life forward, but you understand it backward. And so realizing, um, after a lot of degrees, by the way, um, that I was raised in a family with traumatized parents, right, who, you know, dealt with chronic depression and anxiety and lots of things um, that got normalized in my house that I now understand were responses, right, to unaddressed trauma, um, I think fuels my passion. Um, I have a mom who talked to me very early on about starting to run away from home at eight because she didn't feel cared for and safe, right? And I think, when I came into education, which was backwards, I started in mental health and I worked my way into education because I remember working in mental health. Um, in fact, my very first job out of college was in a program where with, with um, early intervention students who had been put out of three or four preschools um, before they came to the, the site where I worked. And at first I was like, how do you even have enough trauma at three to right. get put out of school? Um, but what I learned, right, um, during that time, right, I was able to sort of connect a lot of dots. Um, and in all of that learning, I learned the same things that made my mom run away, right? Disconnection, dysregulation, homes where somebody is not attuned, 
to who you are and what you need as a young person, right, are scary places to live and it's a scary place to be and it's a scary place to grow up and function. Um, and so just sort of putting all those pieces together, um, once I met those little babies, because I was planning to go to law school, by the way, um, need to make my mother proud. I come from South Central, you know. Um, but I met those beautiful babies. We also had an after school program for kids who were in danger of being put out of the district for their behavior. Um, and what they taught me more than the books, although I had some great supervisors, more than the books, what the kids and families taught me. Um, I originally wanted to go to law school coming out of South Central because I wanted to clean up my community. And what that first experience taught me is that cleaning up my community meant healing it, not imprisoning it. And so all of that, 24 years later, <laughs> here we are. Um, and I have the privilege of doing that work with other folks like yourself now. I mean, isn't it amazing how um, how the how we how we get into what we get into, right? Um, and it, I, what you just said it, it resonated with me big time. You wanted to get into law to clean up your community, right? And now you are the ex equity diversion, equity diversity and inclusion coordinator, right? So I know that really doesn't have to do with education, but how has that impacted that worldview that you had now, given what you know? Because I think it would have changed a ton now, but how? what does that look like now from your point of view and perspective? See, you always ask the big questions. It's one of the things I like about you. Yeah, I came out firing on you pretty hard. That was pretty, <laughs> that, was a, that was a hard one there. Sorry about that. Um. When I first came out of school, and like I said, I had that first job where I was in mental health. I remember thinking, which is what's so full circle in this moment for me, right? Um, I fell in love with kids. I fell in love with the work and I studied on my own and all of those kinds of things, right? Because I wanted to be good, right? I want to be good for kids. I want to be safe for kids. I want to be healthy for kids. And that I understood very early on. So as we off the organization I worked for at the time also had a non-public school, right, where we were looking to reintegrate students, right, into the general education environment. And I just remember thinking, if teachers knew what I know, then school would be better for all kids. And so all of these years later, that's the thing I know, right? That's that's why I'm sitting in this conversation with you. It's why my dissertation work is on trauma-sensitive schools and leadership, because somewhere along the lines, particularly for secondary, we have lost... Um, I think we've lost or been disconnected from our understanding of human development, right? And how human needs trump all of the things on our academic agendas. And for the record, like I'm, you know, I'm that kid, right? I'm a kid who technically probably shouldn't work at equity. School worked for me. It was just about perfect. I was almost a straight A student. Like I did that thing. But what I knew is that I shared my life with somebody I loved who that system did not work for. And I needed to understand my mom is a bright person. She's smart. She's motivated, right? What, what did people miss, right? That allowed that little girl to hide in the basement singing because she was too afraid to tell people that she was hurting, right? What, what caused that? And then the more kids that I've met and encountered over the years in the work, all I've been able to say is what happened and who missed what this baby needed? How do we collectively learn to understand behavior as a communication of need, as opposed to some decision that children are making to be obstinate. What are the words we used to use? We used to use words like incorrigible for, for children whose brains are still forming. Mm. Um, and I think for me, that's the full circle, right? Is realizing that there's so much more to what school can and should be and must be in this generation. In the state of California, 70% of all school children are coming from low income backgrounds, which means they are two or three times as likely to experience trauma before they ever reach school age. We have to know this is not, it's not a luxury, right? To be trauma informed. It's not a luxury, right? To, to be able to consider trauma and, de and human development when we make decisions about kids. It is a necessity if we want to educate all children like we say we do. And in California, like most states, is is also rural, right? And I, I, I think it's really important that we we acknowledge that it's, this is, this is a, national crisis of childhood trauma from your your metropolitan areas all the way out to your rural farming communities 
And for, for some reason, people get caught up with this idea that it doesn't impact me or my community. And to be quite honest, even, even suburban America is being hit really hard, right? There's relational trauma happening big time right now in all communities, right? So when we say this is a, it's really of a drastic, almost epidemic proportion that we are having and seeing this in schools across this country. And I'll even go as far to say globally, because I have had the privilege to to speak globally. And, and two years ago, I was in Australia, New Zealand, and they were asking me the same questions of things we were dealing with post pandemic, right? I'm going back in November to Australia. They're still dealing with some of the things we're dealing with. This isn't a isolated country or state or region. It is a global crisis. And so let's get into that idea of this global crisis around dysregulation. And what are we dealing with? And and I really want to kind of tap into what you were saying prior to, to coming on of what does that dysregulation where let's talk about these different tiers, elementary, middle and high, right? Your experience is mostly in middle and high. Tell me about what that looks like now and where you see people juggling this um, struggle of, man, kids are really coming in dis more dysregulated than they ever have been before. Um, as we talk about in the book, right, we talk about uh, the RISE framework, Right. And we talk about it's like based on, you know, Broffin Brenner's bioecological model. Right. There are all of these interacting systems that happen that are happening with and to us all all the time. Um, and I think in high school, I think in real life, you actually see very similar behavior in middle school and high school as you see in elementary school. It just looks different because the kids are bigger. Right. So when a child is yelling in the hallway in high school, we feel like they must be making a decision. They know better. Feet stomping, kicking walls, you know, tearing down bulletin boards. We assume it must be a decision because they're older. But the last time, the first time as a high school principal or assistant principal, I walked out into a hallway to embrace a, a young lady who was screaming and kicking her classroom door. Um, I walked toward her and I just, I just kind of put my arms out because I was like, this is not good. And this should not probably be the way we start our day together. But as she walked toward me, I could see the tears scroll, scrolling, rolling down her face. And by the time she got to me, she literally fell into my arms. And what she told me was that that was the day. It was the one year anniversary of her brother being shot on their front doorstep. And she had come to school because she thought that was the right thing to do. And she was running down the hallway, trying to get into her class on time. And her teacher saw her running down the hallway, but because the bell was ringing at that time, she decided to close the door while she watched that child run down the hallway. And the girl got to the door and that was all she had, right? All she had was enough to make it to class. And so she broke. And so she wept in my arms and I walked her into my office and I rocked her and we wept on the couch because at some point I cried too. And, and that's just, now I know there's a lot of you out there who feel a way about that, but I'm a human and I want to be a human with my students, right? Whatever children, whoever I serve, other humans, I want to be human with them. There is nothing not tragic about a teenager who died who, and a, a student of mine who lost a sibling and she was there when it happened. There's nothing not tragic about that, right? Um, and so I think for me, that's, that's where it is. It's when we see behavior, whether they are small kids or large kids, the needs fundamentally are the same. I think Abraham Maslow, I know we don't have a lot of research on how true what he said is, but in my practice every day, right? I think that when you get down to it, food and shelter and basic safety, when those two things are not addressed for children, you get all of these behaviors that everybody is panicked about. And I'm like, it's not, it's not as complicated as we've made it. Whether that child is six or 16, hungry children are unhappy people. They are irritable. They are scared. They are frustrated. Right now, how they express that may look a little bit different, but not a whole lot. And in my experience, it doesn't look a lot different. It's that we expect something else somehow from older children, but I don't really know why. When we know what child development says, their brains are still developing, right? At 16, a kid is still nine years away from a fully developed frontal lobe. Of course they make bad decisions when they're upset, dysregulated and all of those things, right? And when we add the layers, right, from Brofenbrenner, when we add an impoverished community, 
right? And my walk to school is not safe. When we add that I live in public housing or in a very poor rural area where there is very little safety for me just between my house and getting to the school door, right? If I'm in a school that's populated with gangs and so walking down the hallway between classes is not safe. A trip to the bathroom at the wrong time of day is not safe. Those are the things our kids are bringing us to work with, right? And we haven't even gotten into the traumas that might be also occurring at home, right? The abuses or the the traumas of, of not necessarily of neglect, but of lack, right? The trauma associated with poverty, like homelessness, right? When you've slept in a car for three nights, scared and afraid, you aren't the nicest person. You you don't want to speak kindly to other people. You don't want to tolerate all of the other childlike behaviors that happen around you because, because you can't. You just don't have capacity. And those are the things. I think. And I think when you're talking about that socio-ecological model, right, that is going to be in our book, and I'm really excited about seeing it, is you're talking about historical context all the way down from historical to systems to organizational to individual, to community individual, right? And – a lot of times, and I've talked about on this podcast so many times, Dr. Noyes, is that we commonly want to talk about things that are happening in kids' homes without looking at our own house. And by that, I mean the school, right? Because there's a lot of children who are in poverty, right, who have unbelievable support systems of relationships and, and networks, but yet they come to school. And it's completely different. They don't have the safety of relationships. They don't have the safety of feeling connected, right? There's kids that don't have that at home and they don't have it at school. And so I, I think a lot of times we put this responsibility on individuals, even children. It is their responsibility to fix their behavior based off of what my expectations are when we're not backing up far enough to look at the bigger picture and say, hold on a minute. This school, and I'm speaking about mine in general when I was a principal, was underserved and undersupported for many, many years in, 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 in a, a community that had never been given resources, right? And then we look at the families and, well, kids are late or, well, parents were working multiple jobs. And when kids came in late, I said, I'm really glad you're here. Because I was, right? And then when we had parent meetings, the parents couldn't make it. Well, no kidding, they're working, right? We have to see the bigger picture to see down to how is it impacting individual kids. And then what is our role in that? Because we're all part of this system, right? So how are we going to unapologetically disrupt these systems to say we're going to do it differently? And to be quite honest, that's what trauma-informed education is. It's saying, no, 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 no. We've gotten it wrong. I will tell you, I got it wrong. I psychologically hurt children in the beginning of my principal career. And that's really hard for me to say, but it's the truth. I was restraining kids. I was suspending kids. I was doing things to kids, not with kids, right? And families. And there's layers to that too. I think we have to start getting into these really deep conversations and what we can do because ultimately, right? We have dysregulated adults as well, and there's systematic reasons for that too. So let's get into that, right? Because I know that pre-pandemic, it was different. It was on some levels. Let's just say right now, every year, all the seven years I was principal were really challenging right now because this is the time in which it, it, you feel like you're on the downturn, but then you've got all the standardized testing, you've got hiring things, you've got people transferring, figuring out if they're going to get new jobs, budget season. It's just, it's this crazy season, right? And then then all of a sudden you've got the pressure of testing and it, it feels like the morale is continuing to sink. And then you hit March, April, and then May. It's like, okay, now we're going to change everything that we do in schools. Every kid's going to be dysregulated because we quit doing things that were familiar, right? And we do new schedules and we do field days and we do parties and then kids dysregulated and we go, why are they dysregulated? But right now let's talk about adults because I think it's important too, you know, and that's part of our book. That's part of what we're writing about is this isn't just about what we can do for kids, but what we can do for adults. And I think systems of support for adults is imperative. It is imperative, right? But or I'm going to say, and it's imperative and we have to also acknowledge our own journeys and lived experience and what we're bringing to the table. Because if we don't, then we can't understand why that 
activated me or why that um, uh, invoked whatever it did. So I'm going to share really quick, and then I would love to hear some of the things that you've experienced in in your um, work. The, one of the things, and I've talked about it here many, many times, is a tap-in and tap-out system that we had at Fall Hamilton. And it was simply, uh, by the way, we quit using walkie-talkies. We didn't use them anymore. We actually used GroupMe, which is a, an app on the phone. And principal's like, you let teachers have their phones? Yeah, they're grown. The adults, they, okay. Um, so everything was via group me. We had multiple channels. One of them was a tap in and tap out. That tap in and tap out basically allowed an adult who was dysregulated for whatever reason. I tear, I share this all the time. I my, my mom passed away while I was a principal, right? I had a veteran teacher whose son was tragically killed in a car accident. I had uh, health diagnoses. I had lots of things happening in the school that I was leading, right? It doesn't just stop after you get out of school. Life continues, right? And we all have those experiences. May not be traumatic necessarily, but hard, challenging uh, life experiences. So part of that was if for whatever reason I was dysregulated, I could go in and say tap out, right? Somebody, matter of fact, multiple people were coming. One person would say, do you need somebody to go with you or do you need to be by yourself? Some people, I'm, I like to be by myself. So I go to my office, i close my door and I take a few minutes, right? Teachers go to their car, they go outside, they get a drink of water, whatever it is. And then the the adult, the other adult steps in the class and make sure it's 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 supported, right? That's one strategy that you could literally take tomorrow and implement. And I encourage people, people, what are my principles not? Then do it on your team. Say, listen, can we support each other in this? Somebody step in my door Let's watch multiple classes. I've got to take a minute because we're pushing teachers into the corner saying, take care of yourself, self-care, 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 why the system in itself is starting to put the pressure down. And it's important. Dr. Noyes, what are some of the things that you saw or have experienced in yours when it comes to adult support? I actually just wanted to piggyback on what yeah, please. you said um, about the stress that we're seeing with adults. I actually think the stress we're seeing with adults is because we treat them the same way we treat the kids and their families. Absolutely. Right. I just said to somebody for the first time, I was like, so that thing where we told people, oh, well, just leave it all at the door when you come because you're at work or leave it all at the door. Mm. Because you're home now, um, after many years of therapy, for the record, so let me be clear, like I didn't mm -hmm. come to this because I'm brilliant or because I read it in a book. I came after many years of therapy where my therapist helped me fully integrate my humanity, mm -hmm. where I came to realize there is no leaving it at the door, mm -mm. right? Um, my condolences about your mom. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom, by grace, is still with me. Um, she has uh, severe rheumatoid arthritis. Mm. And at one point, um, it was difficult, like she couldn't move unmedicated and she had a slip and fall. I remember what it was like to be at work two hours away from where she was, mm. right? And find out that she fell, right? And now I need to coordinate the world, right? In order to make sure things happen for her. But somebody expects to see me at work the following morning, right? And they not only want me at work, they want me full throttle at work. They want me fully focused. And for years, it was that way without even the humanity of good morning, how are you? Right. And so I realized I, I had the privilege. One of the other things, um, along with your tap out, which I love, I got to implement something like that when I had when I was principal of a middle school. Right. We were much smaller. And so group B was very, very fast. And we were big on just tell us what you need. If you need somebody, tell somebody to come right now. Mm -hmm. if everybody's taught. We will figure this out. I promise. Right. But we, we definitely used to come and sort of tag. Take your time and we're going to come in here, even if that was me as the principal. Um, one of the other things that helped me to build trauma sensitivity um, at the high school level was that I worked for an organization that used a coaching model, right, for, for leadership, mm -hmm. um, particularly focused on instruction. For me, I'm, you know, a disruptor. So I, you give me cool things, I break them open and add things to them because, you know, like Christopher M. Did, I'm a little ratchetemic with mine. So uh, it's got it's to gotta reflect me. Whatever I do has Absolutely. to be. Absolutely. Because I don't Make it I, yours. I, the energy to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. right? But what what the expectations around coaching did for me as an as an administrator was there was a block. I was going to visit teachers right during a class, right, observe a class for at least 15 minutes every two weeks. And then we were going to debrief right in the model. Debriefs were only supposed to take 15 minutes. Mine, mine usually took 30 or 45 because Absolutely. I was in the first 10, 15 or however many we needed with how are you? 
and mm -hmm. to sit across from that person or on Zoom, sit, you know, screen to screen, look them in the eye and try to see this human, right, who I've asked to do this enormous feat. Teaching is hard, right? We we don't talk about that enough. Like teaching is difficult, right? We used to say things like, oh, it's not, it, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. Well, let's go back to that brain surgery idea. Yeah, it kind of is, right? It might work from the outside in, but it's still the same, right? It's powerful and teaching well is hard. And so when you sit across from this human and much like you, right? I had the privilege of working with teachers. One teacher, I've been with her through two lost parents, right? A kid going to high school, kids going to college, um, divorces, you name it, all kind of life is happening. And it is happening to teachers in the same context in which it is happening to students, right? Teachers are not the most well-paid folks, right? You've got a, 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 pair, a teacher who's married to another teacher, right? There's a strike in the neighboring district, right? Their income is affected by that fact, right? When COVID was happening, right? If there's an outbreak in their community, they are affected by what happens, right? All of these things, right? The world is dynamic. Life is dynamic and it's happening with teachers all the time. And so for me, coaching was one of the best things. It gave me a built-in bi-weekly check-in with this other human where I could follow up on the last thing somebody told me. I knew I was doing my job right the day that a teacher walked into a debrief and she said, can I ask you for a favor? And I was like, absolutely. She was like, my mom just got a diagnosis. Would you pray for her? That was how we started our debrief meeting, right? If they mm -hmm. didn't come with it, I came with it. Hey, you said your son was working on X, Y, and Z. How is that going? What's happening? How are you? Um, I noticed so-and-so came out of class the other day. Are you, are you okay? Before we talk about the incident and we unmask all the details and we, you know, come with our protocols, it's just, how are you? are you okay? I had a teacher who was chronically late per her peers who were very upset that she seemed to be getting away with being chronically late. When I got to have the conversation, I said, hey, some folks mentioned this to me. Um, is there anything you want to share? She said, yes, I'm raising a 15 year old and my mother has Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't ask her to correct it. We didn't do a corrective action. I corrected the action. Right. I had staff who were on the floor when her classroom needed to be open. I had staff who could watch those kids. So I assigned somebody to do it. Why? Because the human, right, who I needed to come to school and teach every day, who was still willing to give what she had available in her humanity to teach, was a, going to be a better teacher if she wasn't stressed about getting written up, if she wasn't stressed about what I or some other administrator was going to have to say about her being late. We just adjusted the system for the human. And Historically, right, as a nation, we work, we are bound by lots of systems and roles that have not worked for the people in them. We live in a patriarchy that hasn't worked for women in hundreds of years. Let's just tell the truth, right? We live in, we used, we used to think we lived in a meritocracy. That's not true and it didn't work. Right. But our teachers live in all those same systems, even in education. Right. We've asked teachers to do the same thing, leave everything outside and come and teach and come and be. Come and allow somebody else's family to be more important to you than yours. And it, it's not good for our humanity. If what we want from teachers is, is for them to be able to connect to students, they have to bring their whole selves, which means they cannot leave any part of themselves at the door. They've got to bring all of that. I have cried in a room as a teacher, right? We had a teacher who lost a child. Right. And we, you know, we had celebrated her when celebrated with her when she got when she found out she was pregnant. And the school, that baby was everybody's baby, right? We had been mm -hmm. you know, the the, the, the uh, parent association had thrown her a baby shower, right? And she lost her baby at like eight months. He was stillborn. Mm. And we needed to deal with that, right? We needed to prepare kids because at some point that teacher was gonna come back to school. She wrote a letter that she asked us to read to students. I remember sitting in the class with students, right? Looking them in the eye and reading that letter and seeing kids tear up. And so I teared up with them and we just cried together, right? And we talked through how we were gonna love her when she got back. And so for me, it's, it's practice, right? It's one, it's check-in. If somebody pops into your mind, that is your intuition telling you something. As administrators, and leaders specifically, but also as other humans, we need to trust our intuition, right? If you feel like you need to go left, even though that's the long way to the next thing, do it. Pop in. If you saw somebody in the in the parking lot this morning and they look like they were having a hard time, swing by 
because those connections, right, one, create the safety we need so that we can be honest with each other, because when educators can bring them whole, their whole selves to work, they do better work, right? But we're also more regulated when we know that we are in an environment where we can get what we need. And it starts with being able to tell you what it is I need, right? I almost had a car accident on the way to work. You know, something bad happened with my kid, whatever it is. And then us just being attuned to one another, right? We understand that in human development, when we're talking about small kids, right? That how we reflect back to them, right? Impacts their sense of self. I think that's true in education. And I think the dysregulation that we're seeing with teachers is that they keep looking to leadership to reflect back to them how much they've given. And we don't, we just keep asking for more. And you know, that I think that goes, that goes all the way up. I think about principles in my new role as I'm a principal coach mentor, right? And it's such an interesting space to be in. I'm a non-evaluative and I'll be honest, I've been in it for it almost, it'll be two months in a week. And I feel like I'm just now having authentic, amazing conversations with the principles I get the honor of supporting because I'm truly going, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not reporting what we're doing. I'm literally just here. Right. And it's that one scene human. And I, I shared this, I think on this podcast, you know, I, I have had two years of principal recovery is what I refer to it as the time that I stepped out as of being a principal. And I came back um, to the principals meeting for the first time. And it was like, it felt like summer camp to me, right? Like I got to come and see all my friends. I haven't seen them in a long time. I was so excited and full of energy. And it was like, I was like coming off a of vacation and I walk out on the beach to see all my friends and I look out and all of their heads are under the water. That's what I metaphorically saw. I saw people drowning. One of the closest colleagues that I had, he was a mentor of mine my first few years of being a principal. He was sitting down and he's like, what are you doing here, man? And I said, where have you been? And he's like, <laughs> funny. And I said, how are you? He goes, I'm worn out. I am absolutely and utterly worn out. And I think when we're talking about all of this, Dr. Noyes, is that context is important, right? I'm in Tennessee and we are in, it's, we've literally become the battleground education and educators are on the battleground right now against in what those refer to as indoctrination and hurting children and preparing them for uh, sexual predators. And these are all of the propaganda that are being spread, right? And this isn't just Tennessee. These are Texas and Florida and uh, in Arkansas, there's a lot of states that are under this additional pressure, not to mention we're under a universal voucher bill that, it, there's just so much happening. And and I look at educators and I'm the uh, same way I look at students, right? Who are in situations. Why wouldn't you be dysregulated? Why wouldn't you be upset? Why wouldn't you be frustrated? Why wouldn't you be even angry? Right. And I also hear what you say. Like we have to see each other as humans as well. And knowing people just can't do it right now. And what can we do to support them? Because sometimes just showing up is the most radical act they can do. Just showing up was a radical act, let alone all of the other things, right? And so I, I think we're in a conundrum right now because we, we are looking at each other and saying we're all tired, we're all exhausted, we're all overwhelmed without a voice, without being able to advocate for ourselves, especially here in my state, we can't even, you can't advocate. It's, it's, it, if we were all walk out, apparently it's illegal, right? So it's like how, if you're in this oppressive environment, how do we encourage educators? And to me, I believe this, it can happen internally in a school. It can, because I was in one that we did this. We're having each other's back, like what you just said, seeing humans first. Why were you late? Not why were you late? Hey, are you okay? And that's not from me as an administrator. That's from your colleague. Hey, do you need anything? It seems like maybe, you know, you haven't, you're getting here a little bit later. Is there anything I can do to help? That's where those doors begin to open. Well, I'm taking care of my mom who has Parkinson's and my 15 year old son who I'm, I'm having a hard time getting to school, right? conversation is really where it comes down to because not only has the outside dehumanized educators, but I feel like we've dehumanized each other internally on some levels. If we're not cautious, it is a slippery slope that I've seen hit so many school cultures 
that it's we're we're it's crumbling from the inside out and the outside in. And so I really believe that as a community, a school community, parents, teachers, principals, paraprofessionals, everyone in the building, if we can commit to seeing each other as humans and just showing up, right? Just showing up for each other. That is step one. What are, what are some of your thoughts around that? I agree 300%. Um, I think it definitely starts with that. Just, I'm here and and I'm going to charge leaders who are on the call. Leaders, teacher leaders, and, and principals up, right? I had the privilege of working in a school in a very underserved community when I first started in administration. And at the time, they had what our organization would have called the most disgruntled staff um, <clears throat> in our entire organization. And <laughs> myself and my two, my principal, my other AP and our Dean, we sat down and made some very basic agreements. The first one was that we were going to treat teachers with the same kind of love and respect and care we wanted them to treat children with. We were going to pour in what we wanted teachers to pour out because it had to come from somewhere, right? We were already clear that teachers were burnt. We were already clear that teachers were tired. So we endeavored not to make them more tired. Does that mean that we lowered the standard for teaching? No. But it does mean, right, that we made it our business, right, where previous administrations might have, you know, not kept the, it, the evaluation schedule. We kept the coaching schedule, right? We made it our business. We covered each other's backs when it came to, hey, I've got to meet with so-and-so and I'm dealing with this behavior. Nope, I'm going to take the behavior so you can go meet with teacher X because we need to be there. We needed to show up for them. We need to show up in the room and demonstrate, right? That keeping this meeting is not about this evaluation schedule. Keeping this meeting is about the fact that you are important to me as a human and I need to see what you need. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to do. And we kept it during COVID. In fact, I saw I spent more time with teachers during COVID um, than I did um, before that because we only had half a school day. So I got to coach all the time. I was with most of my teachers. And at that time, I don't know, I was probably coaching a team of 16, 17, 18 teachers. I saw most of them every week. Right. But the time that we spent right in that 30 minutes, it was 15 minutes of just me and them. Just how are you? What's on your mind? What's going on? Is there anything that you need support with? You know, what What do you need? That's one. Two is visibility. Um, every morning after we greeted kids at the gate, and as an administrator, I greeted kids at the gate every day. Me too. Uh, all of my AP ship and most of my principal ship, right? Mm -hmm. And then I walked the halls. I walked in and laid eyes on every single teacher on, you know, on what, when it was high school, it was my floor, right? We had, each of us administrator had an assigned floor. We needed to go lay eyes on folks. Not to check and see if you were on time. No, we need to know if you're okay. Is everybody mm. okay? Is everything okay before we launch into this day? I think those things matter. Three, one of my, uh, who was a mentor to me, um, and she was the first AP I ever worked with. She was a longtime educator. Um, and she was she came from elementary school. And so we agreed that we, we built a calendar for teacher appreciation. Mm -hmm. So we had teacher appreciation every month. So every month there was something, right? So, you know, the first year, I think, you know, we had a staff retreat and we did all of those kinds of things. And then every, once a month, right? So whether it's apples and wonderful notes, right? Or it was painted rocks with your name on them, or it was release time, you know, when we should have, we usually would have had PD and just giving time back to folks. Um, we found ways to say thank you and to say we appreciated them as much as possible. Um, my second year, we had seven, I want to say seven teachers lose somebody in their immediate sphere, right? In the, I want to say six to eight weeks, right? We had seven people on staff lose someone. And I remember sitting down with the admin team, and we were a large admin team at that time, and saying, um, what are we going to do for folks? And, you know, folks are looking across the room like I'm speaking not English. Um, and so my boss and I agreed. He was like, well, I'll buy cards. And I was like, great, then I'll get addresses because we were going to break. And so at the admin Christmas party, <clears throat> I walked in with cards. And before people ate, I was like, I need you to sign every single card for somebody who has lost someone. And we mailed them. But I also remember the response. A staff member who walked up to me was like, I didn't know the VP of schools knew who I was. Somebody who walked their campus and, and said hello all the time. They mm. thought, I didn't even know that person knew who I was, but 
it counted to them that we cared, right? And so I think it's those very human things. We also found a way to give awards. Like, I think we made one up that year. It was a rough year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, in architecture, they give something called the Pritzker Award. Mm -hmm. um, so we changed the name and called it the Gritzker because uh, it was a rough year. We needed a lot of grit to get through it. Um, and we gave out the first one. And then it was a teacher award. So from that point on, the teacher who got it gave the next Gritzker, right, to somebody who they saw putting in the work, doing the best that they could. Um, we also did um, a couple of years, we did a round of self-care buddies. So during professional development time, we paired people together to talk about how they take care of themselves, right? And to agree, right? You know, you tell your buddy, okay, this weekend I'm gonna go to the beach and they say, okay, well, I'm gonna take my kids to the park, right? And then a couple of PDs later, you give self-care time for the self-care buddies to check in on each other, right? And so it's it's like you said, it's just helping people intentionally build those connections and building them into PD time. So not just, oh, we expect teachers to care for each other because they're caring humans. That's nice. But if it's important, right, priorities are what show up in our professional learning time. So if self-care was important for us with teachers, right, then we we connected teachers to each other and then gave them time during the workday to have that conversation, to make that check-in. We checked in, right? Rounds in the morning, rounds after lunch, rounds at the end of the school day, self-care buddies, right? So we were trying to build that tapestry, right? Build that, that safety net for folks so that everybody felt, you know, we talk about kids having one caring adult at least one caring adult in the building. Well, teachers should too. Absolutely. You know, it's so funny. And this is why I want to have this conversation because you're talking, I'm like, oh my goodness, I forgot we did that. Oh my goodness, we did that, right? So one of the things that we did, and I, I've kept this, and it's like one of my prized possessions to be quite honest, is people like, oh, you got to do book study, you got to book study, book study. Nobody, I mean, let's be honest, educators are exhausted. People just aren't doing book studies, right? And let me tell you what we did. We did a call, we called it the traveling book study. And it was what great, wait, great. And this is a great little thin book that's easy to grab some ideas, right? What's what great teachers do differently? Seventeen things that matter most. And what we did is, teachers would locate things that they saw other teachers doing that were awesome, and they would highlight it, and then leave a personal note to the other teacher, and then it became their responsibility to find something great about another teacher. And they would go in and they would write a note and leave it in that person's box. And it traveled. And then we wrote the names of the teachers in the front of the book so everybody could see who hadn't gotten it. Right. And it doesn't take long. This is just minutes of time to say, I see you. You're rocking it. You're doing awesome. These are game changers. We also had uh, human accountability partners where we partnered each people with each other just to just to check in. How are you? And it's interesting because one of the teachers, and I mentioned, you know, her adult son passed away in a tragic accident. And who was there at that given time was her accountability partner. They kept in, they every year would say, we want to stay the same. We want to stay the same. And guess what we did? We made accountability partners for students, fourth grade and third grade, second and first grade. We taught them how to care about each other by, hey, what are your personal goals? What do you want to do? Right. Hey, how are your academic goals? Right. They shared their own and it wasn't something that we these are strategies that are grounded in just being human, but being focused. Also, one of the most powerful tools, I think I thought in, in my district, actually, I just came back and I just met with the, um, the chief of academics and he said, you know, Portel, the one thing that you did was shared leadership. Well, let me tell you, Dr. Noise, the only reason I had to do shared leadership is because I couldn't do it all on my own. It's just not possible, like not possible. And so what does that shared leadership mean? Let me give you some examples. Decision-making is really important. Rarely, although I did, make decisions just solely on my own, right? When it came to big stuff. Of course, every day I'm making 3 million decisions to the point that I get home on my wife's like, what do you want for dinner? And I'm like, I don't even know. I can't make any more decisions. Right. But to me, there were multiple types of decisions. There was one, it's a decision. I'm, just, I'm making the decision. I tell the staff, this is the decision. Two, I need your feedback. That doesn't mean that I'm going to do what you're telling me, but I need to hear from you so I can make a decision. Three, it's a decision. You make it. I don't care. Right. Those were kind of the decision making tools. And when you give pow the power to the people that you're working next to, they didn't work for me. They worked with me. Right. And we start having these circles of what decision do we want to make? 
that's powerful, right? I want to hear from you or tell me what you want, right? That's really powerful. And then something else that we did was called a productive dialogue circle in which I, every year we had this, it would start stirring about October, November, um, where kids aren't being held accountable, right? And it was something that came up often. So of course I would connect to how I hold teachers accountable, which was how I wanted them to hold kids accountable. We had a mantra called pre-forgiven, which means you're going to make mistakes. That doesn't mean you're going to get punished for it. That just means you make a mistake and we got to figure out how to solve the problem. That's what it came down to. And so we, um, well, before that, let me back up. We had core values that we created as a school, not me, the school. And these core values are who we say we are. Even in the midst of the hardest of days, these are what we've committed to as a staff. It was created by the staff, went to the leadership. They tightened it up, went back to the staff, and then brought it to me. And we, this was our, it wasn't mine. I was part of the process. So when we did these productive dialogue circles, we kept that as our back wall. This is who we say we are. Because when you're upset, when you're frustrated, when you're exhausted, when you're tired, when you're dysregulated, sometimes those core values can become uh, mediocre at best, right? And we would break off into these collaborative groups and we would have conversations about potential solutions. Sometimes we use scenarios that were really from the school of what we'd experienced or what a kid had experienced. and Or sometimes we just put a bucketed idea and this is what we're trying to solve. And then people came with problem or solutions. And the powerful thing is it was the solutions from the staff. It wasn't like I had secret solutions that I wasn't pulling out. And I was like, I just want to watch everybody suffer, right? And then we could agree upon two or three solutions, and that's where we put our energy, which were backed by the object, our 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 our, um, our core values that matched our mission statement. You know, people think that all these things are just fluffy. They're not. These parts of schools are imperative because it's hard, and you have to have things to back up to, and you have to have a focus to know what you're doing to move forward, right? And sometimes that means. I have to be held accountable as a principal. And I had staff hold me accountable. I had them say, Portel, you said this. You didn't give us the time. We've got, we have to have the time. I didn't get offended. I'd be like, dang, you're right. Right? You're so right. And my school counselor, who I refer to as Yoda, because she was like the keeper of all knowledge. She was really quiet. But when she spoke, it was like, it was like, it was, she was Yoda. And I remember asking her something. She goes, oh, well. Sure, I can do that, but then I can't do this. And this was meet with kids every day. And so she put that into my administrative role of it's your decision. I will do what you ask me to do, but what priorities do you have? Right? So she backed up to those core values. And I had to say, got it. I'll I'll work on this other thing in a different way. Right. So I think sometimes those relationships of what you said of building are imperative. And that's what it is. The last thing that I that I um, prioritized, Dr. Noise, was fun. It was fun. Listen, I laugh all the time. I do. And as a principal, you can ask my staff. I found the craziest things the most humorous, right? It's just how it is. People say, what's your leadership style? I say Michael Scott from The Office and Ted Lasso. Those are my, that's my, that's my leadership style, right? So one thing I did was Tracksuit Tuesdays. It was actually came up by, I think it was by a paraprofessional. She's like, you know, we should all wear tracksuits. I'm like, I think it's brilliant. So we did tracksuit Tuesday. So every Tuesday we wore tracksuits and we had custom names put on either back of the tracksuits. And guess what happened on Tuesdays? Kids started wearing tracksuits. It wasn't standard school attire. We didn't care because we were having fun. And it was, again, it brought people together. They were a part of something. Something else that we did that a lot of people are like, I can't believe you did that. We did Pranksgiving. Um, because, you know, Thanksgiving, the whole idea of Thanksgiving and what we teach in schools is not really actually um, historically accurate in a lot of places. But we did Pranksgiving, and Pranksgiving was you had to opt in, and for that half day, pranks were okay. I'm going to tell you, Dr. Noise, I have not had so much fun the day before a break. Usually everybody's, like, calling off, and nobody wants to come in. Everybody shows up because it's, like, it's on. It's those little things, right? I also used to do what caller are you? I used to, um, I would get the community to give gift cards and things. And then I would go over to the loudspeaker and I would say, caller number 15 wins a gift card. And so everybody would call in and I would be like, sorry, you're caller number two. I'm sorry, you're 
caller number three. It was hilarious. And people laughed and we had fun, right? We have to bring fun back to school. I'm like Justin Timberlake of education here. I'm bringing fun back. We have to. We have to laugh because we're going to cry. And like you, Dr. Noyes, I openly cried in front of my staff. I openly cried in front of my parents. And I openly cried in front of my students. It's just the human experience. I remember one. I'm not going to say his name. And I may have precipitation in my eyes. This little boy had so much potential. It's, I mean, just unbelievably brilliant. But everybody can convinced him that he wasn't. And as I'm on my knee with his mother sitting behind him, I'm looking at him and I could not help it. Why? Probably because I was looking at myself. But I just told him everything, whether it was appropriate or not, I don't know, what I needed to hear then too. And I remember him looking at me, putting his head down, then looking back up and giving me a hug. Right? We don't always get it right. And that may not have been right, right? But showing up authentically, humanly first, just showing up authentically. And from an administrator standpoint, that means sometimes saying, you all, you know what? I'm going to beep this out. I, I've got this new thing. I've got to, I don't even know how to do it. It's an utter sugar, honey, and iced tea show. If you, sugar, honey, iced tea. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sugar, honey, and iced tea show, you all. It's, it's rough right now. And you know what? We're going to keep on keeping on. Sometimes that honesty is imperative. Like, don't pretend it's all okay when it isn't, right? And then I also used to cry a ton when I would share about how proud I was of the staff because I truly was so proud to be part of such an amazing place with amazing educators who were doing amazing things with kids, not two kids. I would just bawl like a baby to the point that at one faculty meeting, they all put tissues in their pockets and I surprised them and I didn't cry. They were so disappointed because they were all just going to throw them at me. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't cry. So um, I think that's true. And from a leadership standpoint, vulnerability is a key. Vulnerability is a imperative key to the success of a school culture is when a leader can be vulnerable, be honest, um, and that can be that can be both ways. It can be I'm struggling, or we're struggling, or this is we're not getting it right, um, because that's a radical sense of caring, right? And you said that too. Accountability doesn't look like a write up. Accountability looks like you know what? I see you're struggling. What can I do to support you? I care so much about you. I want to see you successful. What can I do? Uh, I'm gonna share one more thing, Doctor Noise, and then I'm gonna then I'm gonna turn it over to you to to give the last words. I can tell you, I just started back at the school district and um, we were at a school and we concluded being there all day, listening to planning meetings and meeting with the, uh, the last team of support. And um, they said, well, we got to type up an email about um, kind of the day. And I said, I'm, I'm not typing up an email about the day. And they said, why isn't, well, who are we sending it to? Well, we got to send it to this. I'm not doing that. And they said, why? Well, what do we have to report to them? We're the support. We, I said, I'll tell you what, we'll type up an email, but it's only what we're going to do for this school and principal, not what they can do for us. Because at the end of the day, I remember being a principal and support came in and all that meant was you're going to tell me more to do for you. We have to get support means support. So we did type up an email and it was only what we were going to do for the administrators, for the coaches and for the teachers. And that in itself, Dr. Noise, made people a little bit uncomfortable. And I thought, why? Right? Why? Why can we not hold ourselves accountable and treat people, right? Exactly how we want them to treat each other, to treat the kids. Um, and this Friday, I get the privilege of joining a staff in New York um, where we were supposed to do professional development. We're not doing that. We're actually going to come together as a staff and we're going to do all the things that we just said. We're going to affirm. We're going to connect. We're going to, we're, we're going to cry probably um, because it's been tough and they're, 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 it's tough. And I think validation is key. So Dr. Noise, I told you 45 minutes was going to, it's actually been almost an hour um, and we could talk for like another day or two, but we're going to continue to talk. And um, you all, I'm going to give Dr. Noise the last, uh, last question, but you hear our conversations. Um, I'm hoping to get 
the whole crew together, all of our authors on the podcast, so you can hear from all of us. Um, the excitement that continues to build around this resource and book um, that has so much amazing lived experience, professional experience, shared experience, and shared knowledge around this resource. I can't wait to get it into the world um, and be able to see it impact um, because you all were putting our heart, our soul, uh, and raw, real experiences into it. So, but Dr. Noyes, what do you want educators to know from you right now? The first thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you so much for answering this very thankless call. Um, as a thought leader and administrator at the level that I'm at now, I endeavor to create um, a worldwide wave of appreciation for the work that you do because it changes lives. I do, I spend my time doing equity work and it's rare that the conversations that I get to have don't at some point mention an educator who changed a kid's life. And I know that you don't always get to see, right, the long-term impact of what you do, but what you do matters. So I always want to start and finish with thank you so much for answering this call. The second thing I want to leave you with is it's okay not to be okay. I sit here before you not as some, I haven't made Yoda status yet. I'm, I'm endeavoring to Yoda before it's all over. Um, but I sit here before you as an educator who has gone through two rounds of burnout, um, including looking my doctor in the face and her going, I need to take you off work or your body's going to take you off work because you're not okay. Um, and if I can just be really transparent with you, right? I was more panicked about what my boss would say than about the fact that my doctor told me that my body was going to fall apart mm. because I did not. I'm a little black girl from South Central. I didn't feel like I was worth the time it took to heal. You are worth the time it takes to heal. You are worth it. Your life is worth it. You, whether or not you got good scores on your teaching, whether or not your kids reached a cut score, whether or not you finished the objective, you are worth it. You are worth healing. You are worth taking time out for. You are worth caring for. You are. No matter what you do, you are worth caring for. Please care for you. And for those of you who are sitting there going, well, I don't, I don't even know how to do that. I'm not sure I like myself enough. I suggest to you something that has been life-changing for me. A friend of mine, when I was in the middle of a, a stage of burnout, having panic attacks and unable to go to work. She introduced me to an author named Louise Hay. And she has a book called You Can Heal Your Life. And it is affirmations, right, that are written like prescriptions for wherever you struggle. Pursue your own wholeness because it'll, it'll impact your practice in ways you can't imagine. But more than your practice, it will change your life. You will be a healthier happier, stronger you. I'm two years past the moment where somebody made that introduction to me and my life is so much better than I could have imagined when I first started. Take good care of you because you are valuable, not only to the folks in your house, but to the folks in the world that you live in. And we need you. Well, Yes. In the words of Franklin or Stephen Covey, you're your greatest asset. Take care of you. And as always, you all, please go into the world and do something absolutely awesome. All right, here we go. 
All right, you all. Thank you so very much for tonight. Um, by the way, I had a hat on last week. It was the first time I've ever worn a hat, and then I have a hat on this week. Um, my son had a soccer game, and I literally came straight, straight from the soccer game, so I threw a hat on. But I kind of like it. it. makes me feel really comfortable, and I wear a hat 90% of the time. Nonetheless, for those of you who came tonight, uh, Jonathan, I know you're here every week. Jack, thanks for being here. Uh, for those of you, unfortunately, some of you, I can't see your, your names, but I see that you're on Facebook. Thanks for being here um, every week if you come. And of course, as always, um, please give us a, a review, give us a like or share, um, because it does push us up uh, in the podcast listen world. Um, I am very excited to say that we are about to hit 250,000 streams, which you all is so exciting to me. Um, that's going to be a huge milestone. Uh, and uh, I don't, we don't, Trauma Informed Educator, Educators Network doesn't make any money. We don't charge anything for this podcast. It is an open resource. Um, and we provide that because we believe in this work. Um, we have now almost 100 episodes. So, for those of you who have I've just been introduced to Dr. Noyes, you're going to be seeing and hearing from her more uh, on this podcast and in the network um, as we join uh, forces with uh, Julie, Julie, and Ingrid in writing this book for Harvard Education Press. Um, Dr. Noyes, if people want to follow you, where can they where can they follow? Do you have social media that they can access? I do. So on LinkedIn, I'm just um, Dr. Taisha Noyes. I'm probably the only Noyes as a last name you're going to find. It is spelled like make a lot of noise, um, which is always fun. Um, on Instagram, I'm Dr. Noise, right? Like one word and C-A for California. Um, and I'm still working on my TikTok. I haven't done TikTok either, but I probably should. I'm sure I would enjoy it. Um, but anyway, thank you all so very much, Dr. Noise. If you'll wait just one second. Um, I, we are not back next week. I think it's a couple weeks. Um, I think it's a couple weeks by next. I'm not actually sure. I don't remember. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll put it on social media when, when I'll record again and I will see you all soon. So take care.